Turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew at chapter number 18. Matthew at chapter number 18, and I want to commence reading in verse number 23 through verse 35. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast them into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that, he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. Verse 35 reads, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Thank you. You may be seated. The grass withers and the flower thereof fadeth away, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I want to talk this morning about God's extraordinary capacity to forgive. God's extraordinary capacity to forgive. This parable is the only parable in the Gospel of Matthew, it does not appear in any of the other Gospels. And the occasion of it is Jesus is giving some ecclesiastical instruction to how to handle discipline in the church. He's talking first about because they were asking who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom and Jesus took a little child and put that child in their midst and said, except you become like one of these, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Be careful how you live in front of these little ones, these weak ones, because the scripture says it would be better for you that a millstone were tied about your neck and you were drowned in the depths of the sea than to cause one of these weak ones, these little ones, to go astray. And then he was talking about how uh, we ought to discipline people who have erred or sinned among the congregation. He said, if your brother is sinning, if he's living in a life that is not pleasing God, go to him one-on-one. -on -one. Read it. It's right there in Matthew chapter 18. Don't, don't spread it all over the community. Don't put it on Facebook. Don't, 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 don't tweet it. Don't put it on Instagram. If you're a true Christian, go to your brother or your sister privately so that the stuff doesn't get all over the church and all over the community and deal with it one-on-one. -on -one. If they refuse to hear you, 
then take another brother or sister with you because it's better in the mouth of two or three witnesses. If they will not hear the admonition of two or three witnesses, then bring them before the entire church because nobody is bigger than the church. Nobody stands against God and lives the way he or she wants to live against the church. And the scripture says you will excommunicate them. They will be exiled from the fellowship. Treat them like a tax collector and a sinner because they are no longer obeying the word of God. And then Peter raises a question to Jesus. Uh, if, if that be the case, Peter says, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? Then Jesus exaggerates the number. Jesus says, not just seven times, but 70 times seven times. In other words, however many times your brother offends, that's how many times you ought to forgive. That is the occasion. That is the platform of this parable. This, this parable is a screenshot of what God is. It's a, it's a photo opportunity for God to show us what forgiveness really looks like. Oh, it's, a, it's, it's an expression of God. It's, it's, a, it's a revelation of the nature and the character of God. Jesus says this king decides one day to call his servants in for a reckoning. For them to give an account of what they owe him. And the first one of the servants that he calls owes his master an extraordinary, incalculable amount of money. He owes him 10,000 talents, an unpayable debt. To, 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 to really grasp uh, what Jesus is saying here, he, Jesus is, is stretching the analogy. He's using hyperbole to demonstrate the contrast between God's forgiveness and our own. He owes the man, he owes his Lord uh, 10,000 talents. Here is how extraordinary an amount of money this is. He owes him the equivalent of 193,000 years of earnings. He would have to work 193,000 years to pay back 10,000 talents. It's an uncalculable amount of money. He would have to work the same as 200,000 people's yearly salary. He would have to work 193,000 years to pay back Billions of dollars. It's an unpayable amount of money. He would not live enough lifetimes to pay his master what he owes. The debt is unpayable. The debt is incalculable. You can't, you can't compute how much money that is. It's an, it's an unimaginable, unrealistic, ridiculous amount of money. And the master says, I want it all. He falls down on his, on his knees and he begs for the master to be patient with him. He said, give me some time and I will pay you back all that I owe. Now listen to me. His saying to the master, I will pay you back everything I owe, is as ridiculous as the amount he owes. Because in as much as the debt is incalculable, his ability to pay it back is impossible. Somebody ought to help me preach it. He owes this incalculable amount of money and he asked the master for patience, give me some time, I'll pay it back. He owes this, this amount of money that you can't even compute, but he tells the master, give me 193,000 years and I'll pay you back. 
Now, now brothers and sisters, Jesus stretches this analogy, and, and you'll have to be a Jew to really get this. Um, the highest amount uh, of numbers that the Jews would count, the Hebrews would count in that day, was 10,000. And the highest unit of measurement for any coinage or for any, any kind of exchange was a talent. A denarii was a small amount of money, but a talent was an unusual amount of money. He owed his master an incalculable debt. You could not count that far the money he owed. And so he asked the master to be patient. Give me some time. I'll pay you back. He asks, listen to this, for patience but the master offers pardon. He says, master, be patient. The master offers pardon. You can't pay me back what you owe me. You won't live long, you won't live long enough to pay me back. You will never amass how much you owe me, so the master just pardons. He said, don't, don't worry about it. The master's heart is filled with compassion. The Bible says he's moved with compassion. He, he's moved with compassion. And he knows that the man can't pay so rather than put him in prison and put his wife in prison and put his children in prison and sell all his property, the master is moved with compassion. And rather than have patience with him, he pardons him. He forgives the debt. Now you can't shout on this unless you are a 10,000 talent in debt person. Uh, some of you can't shout because you've sinned a little bit. But some of us in here who have sinned a lot know that our debt is incalculable. And we are not going to ever live long enough to pay God back the debt we owe. We don't need patience. We need pardon. I wish I had one or two more big sinners in here this morning who can help me testify what I owe. I won't live long enough to pay back the debt that I owe God for the sins I committed. I don't need God to be patient. I need God's pardon. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What, what can make me whole again? I can't sing enough. I can't preach enough. I can't read the Bible enough. I can't pray enough. I will never be good enough because the debt that I owe, I can never repay. Brothers and sisters, the emphasis here, uh, the imagery here, the imagery here is God's forgiveness is munificent. I just learned that word this week, munificent. Munificent means God is benevolent beyond what we can understand. God is lavish in how he forgives. God goes overboard to forgive. God goes out of his way to forgive. God is slow to get angry. But he is plenteous in his mercy. The imagery is that God does not care how much the debt is. He canceled it on the cross. 
Somebody ought to help me preach it. Uh, the book of Colossians says that the handwritten ordinances that were against us, he nailed it to the cross. My sin or the bliss of that glorious thought, my sin not in part, but the whole. They're nailed to the cross and I bear them no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. The reason this morning it is well with my soul is because I owed a debt I couldn't pay. But one Friday, he paid a debt that he didn't owe. Jesus paid it all. Oh, to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but hallelujah, he washed it white as snow. What shall I render? I wish I had a Bible reader. Unto God for all his benefits towards me. He redeems my life from destruction. He satisfies my mouth with good things. He renews my strength like an eagle. Has thou not known? I wish I had one or two more witnesses. Has thou not heard? That the everlasting God, the Father, the creator of the ends of the earth, there's no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increases their strength. Even the youth shall faint and grow weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. The only way you can give God praise is to know how much you owe that you can't pay. I owe God everything and I bring God nothing because I was spiritually bankrupt. I once was lost in sin but Jesus took me in. And then a little light from heaven filled my soul. He bathed my heart in love and he wrote my name above. And just a little talk with Jesus. I wish I had two or three more witnesses here. I was bankrupt. I was broke. And God said, don't worry about it. Your sins have been forgiven. Those of us who read the Bible will we, we'll know the story of this woman who is in the home of Simon the leper. And she comes in with his alabaster box and pulls it on the head of Jesus. But before she does that, she, she washes his feet with her tears. Read it in the Gospel of Luke. And then she dries his feet with the hairs of her head. And the people in the room see that and they start criticizing her and, and, and lambasting her for all this waste of this expensive ointment. And then she comes in here and lets her hair down and washes Jesus' feet. Jesus heard them in their hearts. And I want to tell some grumbler, some complainer in here this morning, Jesus knows how to hear words you don't say. I wish I had time to stay right there. Jesus heard them and Jesus said, Simon, I got something to say to you. Simon said, say on, sir. Jesus said, when I came in the house, you didn't give me any water to wash my feet. Since I've been here, this woman been washing my feet with her tears. 
You, you didn't give me a kiss when I walked in the door. He said, this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet and dry them with the hairs of her head. He said, when you have been forgiven much, you learn how to love much. When you've been forgiven much, you learn how to shout much. When you've been forgiven much, you learn how to praise much. And the reason some of y'all can't praise much is you haven't been forgiven much. But for those of us who know that we have been forgiven. Yeah. His master said, you don't owe me anything. And he walks out, I'm sure, bouncing and skipping because his debt has been canceled. It's the same word for forgiveness of sin. The debt has been canceled. The debt is no more. But now he leaves debt to commit a bad deed. He's just been forgiven. Walks out of his master's presence. Sees somebody who owes him four months wages. That, that's, that's the equivalent of what the servant owes him. The servant, his fellow servant, owes him the equivalent of four months wages. And the servant says to his fellow servant the same thing this servant said to the king. Be patient with me. I'll pay it back. Now the fellow servant was more realistic than the first servant because he could have worked four months and paid him back. But he said, no. No. You out here barbecuing and you owe me money? You know how Negro do, you know, you know. You, you around here at the car wash and you owe me money? You in the mall and you owe me money? Somebody ought to help me preach here this morning. You buying a new dress and you owe me money? Oh. No. He grabs him in the collar. Shakes him up. Chokes him, the scripture says. And says, give me all of my money. And he throws the man in the debtor's prison. I want you to get this. It is very possible to be forgiven and never get saved. Somebody ought to help me preach it. Because there is a concomitant relationship between forgiveness and behavior. Because if you've been forgiven, then you ought to behave like it. And if you can't give what's been given to you, forgiveness does not mean for you salvation. Because it's possible for God to forgive you of your stuff and your heart never change. You're religious, but you're not converted. You go to church, but you're not saved. The scripture is not teaching that you will lose your salvation what the parable is teaching is that salvation is offered to you and you refuse it. 
it has no effect on you. God forgiving you ought to have an effect on you. God giving you pardon ought to have an effect on you. It ought to change your heart. He has just been forgiven an unpayable debt. You can't, you can't measure, you can't calculate how much he owes. And the master is not patient, he pardons. The debt is canceled. You, you don't owe, it's like you, never, you ne like you never made it. You don't owe me anything. He walks out of his master's presence, meets somebody who owes him four months wages, grabs him in the collar, give me my money or you go into prison. Again, it is very possible to receive from God what you can't give to others. Um, in, in Africa, in Africa and a lot of places in the bush, in the, in the wilderness, in the places in Africa where there's not much civilization, they're still basically primitive. Um, they go to who they call a medicine man. Not a witch doctor, a medicine man. And when they go to the medicine man, there's a, a pain here, a pain there. And the medicine man does not ask them, where is your pain? The medicine man's question to them is, who do you need to forgive? Because often there is a direct relationship between depression and unforgiveness. Between physical sickness and you are being out of relationship with your brother and sister. Something physically can be going on in your body that has nothing at all to do with a physical malady. It may have something to do with an unresolved conflict. Somebody you need to forgive. Somebody you need to be reconciled with. Somebody who walked out on you. Who made your life miserable. And you've been holding that for years. And, not, and you got migraines. And you have blood pressure issues. And, and you have indigestion uh, you, you're tired, you're aching, your shoulders hurt, your back is out of line, you, you, you can't get your food down properly, you don't sleep well, you don't have a good night's rest, your days are always filled with anxiety, you're always upset, your fists are always clenched, your temples are always pounding, your eye, you can't see right, you can't hear, you can't enjoy anything. Music you used to enjoy, you don't like it anymore. Food that used to taste good, don't taste the same anymore. There's somebody in your life that you need to let go. Forgiveness means you hurt me, but I'm going to let it go. You did me wrong, but I can't hold it against you because it imprisons me. Oh, brothers and sisters, you, you throw yourself in prison when you don't forgive. You mad. They don't, they don't remarry. And here you're trying to put sugar in the tank. And you don't like to see them coming. Let it go. Because watch this. When you're holding something, nothing can get out But also, nothing can get in. And when you let that go, God will bring this. And this was better than that. 
Let it go. Just, just listen. That's not easy to do. I'm not saying that like you just wake up one morning and say, I forgive you. Let's go get some coffee. No, no. If I see you on the side of the road with a flat, I'm going to help you fix your flat. But you can't ride with me. Somebody ought to help me talk here. Because there is a side of agape love that we don't ever talk about. And the side of agape love is loving unconditionally. But the other side is to love you with a love that's good for you and me. In other words, if I know you're a liar, I love you enough not to tell you my business. If I know you steal, I love you enough not to let you balance my checkbook. If I know that you're messy, I don't give you any sensitive information. That's love that's good for you and good for me. And you got to be like that with people in your family. You got to be like that with your circle of friends. You got to love your family enough to say, no, this time I'm not paying your rent. You're not going to ever get on your feet if I keep on helping you. You're not going to ever make it if I keep on supporting you in your wrong. If you're in trouble, you made your bad heart. Yeah, some of y'all was raised like I was raised. My grandmother put it like this. Freedom. You got it. With a long handled spoon. She said, don't, 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 don't refuse to feed them. Let them eat outside. No, don't, 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 don't be a fool. I mean, you, you, you hurt me, you've destroyed me, you've tried to assassinate my character, you've tried to tear me down. I love you with the love of Christ, and that love does not mean that you and I got to go to Papa Do's for lunch. No, you, you, you eat at Papa Do's on Richmond, and I'm going to eat at the Papa Do's on 610. You go your way, and I'm going to go my way. You get on this side of the street, I'm going to get on that side of the street. And that does not mean that I don't love you. That means that I can't trust you. And if I can't trust you, I can love you at a distance. See how quiet you got right there? God loves us so much that God forgives us freely with no qualifications. And God says, listen, the debt was in unpayable. The deed that he committed was terrible. But the deed that he committed over the debt that he was forgiven seals his doom. The servants see how he's mistreated his fellow servant. And they go back to the master and said, all the debt you forgave him of, you should have seen how he treated his brother. The master says, bring him back here. He comes back before the master and he suffers now what the Latins call Lex Talionis. Lex Talionis is the law of retribution. You reap what you sow. You reap more than you sow. Because this man owed you four months wages, you wouldn't give him time to pay you back, you threw him in prison, now here's what's gonna happen to you. Not only you going to prison, but you owe me everything you were supposed to pay me. And to compound it, I'm not just throwing you in the prison, I'm giving you to the tormentors. Here is the picture. 
Hell awaits unforgiving hearts. Hell enlarges itself for people who don't know how to forgive. Because Christ forgave you. And the application is just like God forgave you that's how you ought to forgive others. I'm, I'm, I'm through. Um, but but, but you, you've heard Shirley Caesar's song, No Charge. Beautiful song. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a song that, that Shirley Caesar sang, sang, sings, but she borrowed it from a sermon that Dr. Caesar Clark preached at the prayer bowl here in Houston. Beautiful song. She, she says the little boy comes and, and, and tells his mother uh, for, for taking out the trash, you owe me one dollar. Uh, for fixing my room, keeping my bed, two dollars. Uh, for, for making good grades, five dollars. For taking care of my little brother while you went to the store, 50 cents. And he adds up the stuff that his mother owes him and uh, he gives her a bill for, for $14.75. And his mother looks down at him as the song goes, turns the paper over and writes this, for the nine months I carried you, growing inside me, no charge. For advice and the knowledge, the cost of your college, no charge. The nights I sat up with you, doctored you, prayed for you, no charge. For the toys, food, and clothes, and for wiping your nose, the cost of my love is no charge. Now, if we raise that to the superlative degree, all the sins you committed, all the lies you've told, all the times you have disobeyed God, all the talents you owe God for the mess you got yourself in that God got you out of, no child. And when you come to church in the presence of the one who forgave you, how dare you not praise him for all that he has done for you. And then when somebody offends you, how dare you not forgive them? I thought about that song as I closed. When my daughter graduated from Dillard, she hugged me and tears in her eyes and said, Daddy, I want to pay you back for all you've done for me. And, and I didn't hold it against her. I know she was, she was caught up in graduation euphoria. <laughs> uh, she, had a, she had a graduation stroke. <laughs> she was just caught up in the excitement of, of graduation. Hugged me and squeezed me and said, Daddy, I'm going I'm to pay you back for for all you've done for me. And, and then I, I got in the car and, and wiped my tears. And, and I said, how much do you owe me <laughs> for letting you sleep on my chest when you couldn't sleep at night? How much do you owe me for being first in the carpool line, picking you up every day from school? How much do you owe me when your fever wouldn't break one night? And I sat up with you till 3 o'clock in the morning and bathed you in alcohol and cold water. How much do you owe me for the scratches that I kissed? For the band-aids that you put on when you didn't have nothing wrong with you? How much do you owe me for the toys and the food and the room and the clothes? All you can do, Victoria is say thank you. Yes. Father, 
brother, how much do I owe you for the breath you put in my body? How much do I owe you for keeping my heart beating all night last night? How much do I owe you when M.D. Anderson said I would never live? And you raised me up off of my sick bed and I'm standing in this pulpit this morning. What dollar amount can I put on your grace? All I can say is thank you. I wish I had some more grateful people in here this morning. I said I wish I had some more grateful people in here this morning. God has forgiven you. You ought to tell God thank you. God has wiped the slate clean. You ought to tell God thank you. Do you remember the stuff you did that you got yourself in? That God got you out of and didn't bring it up again? You ought to tell God thank you. I need some sure enough liar and sinner and wrongdoer in here this morning. You got some decisions you wish you hadn't made. Some roads you wish you hadn't traveled. But God came to see about you. He came right on the street where you lived. Picked you up and turned you around. Placed your feet on solid ground. If the Lord forgave you of your sins, tell God thank you. If the Lord made a way for you in spite of your evil deeds tell God thank you if the Lord wrote your name in the Lamb's book of life tell God thank you if the Lord saved you in spite of your foolishness tell the Lord thank you if there's somebody in here this morning who needs to forgive somebody if you forgive them it will set you free if you turn them loose it will bring you real joy if you stop holding stuff in your heart it will help you shout on Sunday morning that's the reason some of us shout so much because we've learned how to let stuff go stop worrying about who likes you stop worrying about who's done you wrong Stop worrying about who's plotting against you. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. They shall soon be cut off like grass. Won't he do it? He'll prepare a table in the presence of your enemies. Won't he do it? He'll make your enemies leave you alone won't he do it he'll make folk who've been talking about you come back and apologize to you won't he do it he'll make folk who want to see you fall come on and help you to get back up again God will take care of you God will look out for you God will make a way for you if God has done it and you're not ashamed to testify if God kept you and you don't care who's looking at you if God made a way and you don't mind being a witness why don't you hug somebody why don't you tell somebody let it go let it go let it go stop worrying about it God has already worked it out. God has already turned it around. God has already fixed it for you. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he make a way out of no way? Is there anybody here who's been forgiven this morning? Come on, help me shout a while. Can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like the Lord. Have you tried him? Won't he fix it? Won't he fix it? Say yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I know he's all right.
somebody's hand. Tell them I got joy. I've got joy. I've got joy. I know he's all. Hey! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One Friday he died but early Sunday morning he got up to forgive me. He forgave me. He forgave me. He forgave me. He forgave me. I told you this. My brother was on drugs. My brother Ray, who by the grace of God is a deacon at our church now. But he was on drugs. He was, he was on crack. And everybody in here got a, a crack story. Everybody in here got some family member who was messed up on that stuff but the Lord turned them around and uh, he broke in my house. I was in Lake Charles preaching. Eugene, he broke in my house. Him and some of his crackhead friends broke in my house in the VCR days. Stole my VCR. Sold it just to the man down the street and my television and some jewelry. And uh, I called Johnny. I said, somebody broke in my house. Johnny said, it's Ray. I said, no, Johnny, you don't believe. He said, oh, yeah, it's him. Let's go find him. So we found him. And Johnny said, let me do the talking. Because you're too easy. You're too nice. He said, Ray, somebody broke in Terry's house. What? Uh -uh. Oh, hell. No, let me out this car right now. I'm going to find. The biggest actors and actresses in the world are not in Hollywood. They're in your family and mine. So Johnny got a, a bat. And, and I got a golf club. And we were going to look for him. And God is my witness. When I would have got, gotten through with him, I was just that angry. I don't, I don't get mad often because I don't, I don't care what I do once I get angry. And I asked the Lord to keep me from getting to that place because I, I just go blind and, and I'm not responsible. I was just that angry. But when I saw him, I don't know if it was how the sun was shining on him. It's you in or S-O-N but he had my daddy's old hat on my dad had been dead a couple of years and he had my daddy's cowboy boots on and the way he was walking made him look like my daddy and my brother with whom I was mad enough to kill I saw the face of my father and my enemy 
became my brother again because he looked like my father and when you see a brother or a sister in the image of God you can't hate them you gotta forgive them because they look like your father so I came back home and I was crying my mama said I, what's, what's wrong with you I said I saw that boy and, 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 and he looked so much like daddy she said well I thought you was going to kill him I said, I was. She said, boy, you ain't. You know what she said. You know. You know what she said. You know how they talk in my family. But I saw in his face my father, and I couldn't do him any harm because he looked just like my father. Every last sinner has a future. Every last saint has a past. And when you look at him or her as a brother or sister in Christ, no matter what they've done, let it go.